for the last couple of decades has become very complacent in its prosperity, in its democratic institutions, in the idea that war is no longer is no longer possible. And I think this is this has shown that that was a that that, that was a bad miscalculation. Are Western powers indirectly to blame for the conflict in Ukraine? We discussed this topic in a recent client webinar held exclusively for clients of the CRA. If you would like to access the full recording of this webinar, you can do so by becoming a member of the channel. Details down below. Enjoy. All right, so let's look at the security implications for Europe. And um, you know, this is a map of the countries that have joined uh, NATO uh, basically, since German reunification at the end of the Cold War in 1989, uh, there have been 14 countries that have acceded to NATO. I would like to unpack, Nicholas, just what is the the role in your view of, of NATO's expansion? Is this not perceived as a threat by Vladimir Putin that, you know, now you have a potentially uh, missiles directly on your border um, it may, in fact, be in the interests, the short-term interests of many of these countries, for example, the Baltic countries, uh, they have experience of uh, Soviet um, occupation, uh, you know, since uh, the Second World War when uh, Europe was busy fighting Hitler. Um, they, they have uh, bad memories of, of Russian occupation. Makes sense for, for those countries to have joined NATO. But is that not a step too far for Vladimir Putin to countenance? Do you think that uh, this eastward expansion has provoked Putin in many ways? Well, that's definitely, I mean, Putin definitely does view it as a threat. Uh, but those countries, uh, those countries definitely do want to join because they don't trust Russia. A lot of them have a very long and bad history with Russia. Um, at various points in time, Russia and the Soviet Union uh, have occupied parts of Europe. Uh, at the, you know, before the First World War, the Russian Empire stretched all the way into the middle of what's sort of now today called Poland. Um, so a lot of these national uh, uh, groups here um, define themselves in a lot of ways. Their their sort of founding national myths are actually often about throwing off Russian oppression. Um, even countries like Bulgaria and Romania which were not occupied directly by Russia at any point in history, really, um, were still dominated by Soviet puppet states through the 20th century. Uh, so for them, they, they definitely have a, a, a mistrust of Russia. And they don't, I think, entirely buy the argument that the Russian Federation of today is different from the Russia of yesteryear. As for why NATO would want to join them, I think it's because ever since the, the, the 90s, um, there was at least a brief opportunity perhaps, or at least a perception that relations could improve between uh, Western Europe and the United States and Russia. But for various reasons, uh, uh, partly to do with the economic collapse, partly to do with uh, some of Russia's moves towards its neighbors, partly to do with uh, what the Russian see are broken promises, that never really, uh, that never really happened. And as the tension and mistrust is built between West and East, the West has been increasingly uh, eager to uh, add those countries um, in green to its, its sort of sphere of influence, to its alliances um, as part of a way, at least in part, to contain Russia. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of critics of NATO say that this has been a major problem because it's provoked Russia, it's made it more aggressive militarily. Uh, and that's a difficult, regarding the question of what the world looks like without the eastward NATO expansion, it's very difficult, of course, because it's a counterfactual. I think that personally, I think that those arguments are over, oversold. I think that if NATO hadn't expanded some of these countries like in the Baltics um, and maybe even Poland, you might, uh, you might see something more akin to in the year 2020 when NATO hadn't expanded um, Russia's relationship towards those countries as it currently has towards a lot of Central Asia, where it uh, often gets involved in the politics of those countries. We recent, actually, just before this conflict, we saw Russia intervene in Kazakhstan um, to, to suppress an, an, an uprising there against the leader of Kazakhstan. So, yeah, now this is definitely the foremost thing on Putin's mind. Um, the question remains, though, is yeah, <laughs> it'll depend who you ask, whether you ask the West or Russia, as to how provocative this really was. So, Terence, do you think that NATO and the EU as well underestimated Vladimir Putin and his willingness to send troops into Ukraine? Because you know, regardless of the 
the interests of those countries, um, you know, you have to ask, was it right to let those, uh, to let you, Ukraine, you know, engage in this discussion to join NATO? And, you know, here we are with Russian missiles raining down upon Kiev and other parts of the country. So, you know, I take Nicholas's point that this was a bit of a counterfactual, there may have been aggression anyway. Um, but it certainly, in terms of the balance of power in the region, seems to upset the balance. Look, I think that, um, as I say, one has to kind of step through step through a looking glass here. Um, what you have, uh, what 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 most of of uh, the other former Warsaw Pact countries seem to have done, the, the Poles, the Czechs, is to have uh, moved to some form of democracy, often messy, uh, flawed, you know. Russia has not gone has not gone in that direction. Um, I believe that you know from a from a hard real politic uh, position, uh, Russia can make a can can make a, a decent sensible case. Um, and I think that historians will spend decades arguing whether the um, whether the engagement between uh, uh, between the geopolitical West and um, and Russia post Cold War was. Uh, was handled correctly, um, but I, you know, I do think that 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 within Russia itself there are impulses within the Russian Federation's elite political culture, of which Vladimir Putin is a uh, is 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 the figurehead. There are impulses which would be very uncomfortable for smaller countries to live with. Much has been said in the last decade about the collapse of the uh, of the, the liberal world order. We saw this when with the Brexit vote, we saw this with 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 the election of Mr. Trump with a populist wave in, um, uh, in Europe. I think that, that, that the people making that argument get it wrong. This sort of liberal world order it dates maybe from 1990 and it was never fully consolidated. Uh, in the 1970s, um, uh, only about 30 countries in the world could reliably change their uh, uh, change their governments through a through, through a democratic vote. In a sense, I don't know. I, I I would say we are almost defaulting to to what was the condition of the 20th century, um, where a where, where a country like 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 Russia is asserting its its great power status, um, and where the geopolitical West. Culturally, has become very um, uh, almost well for the last couple of decades. Has become very complacent in its prosperity, in its democratic institutions, um, in the idea that war is no longer is no longer possible. And I think this is this has shown that that was a that, that that was a bad miscalculation. Thanks for watching. Let's hand over to you, our audience. Do you think that Western powers indirectly contributed to the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, if you enjoyed this extract from our recent client webinar, you might want to join us as a member of the channel. That will give you access to all of our upcoming members-only live streams, as well as recordings of our past events. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.